Welcome, friends, it's the Movie Boom Podcast. Movie Boom Podcast, enjoy the show. Zachy and Brian are talking about the movie. It's the Movie Boom Podcast on the radio. Welcome to Movie Film. It's episode 297. I'm Zachy Hassan. I'm here with Brian Hall. Hey, how's it going, Zachy? You know, Brian, as you and I are chatting, we are time zones apart. I know. I'm uh, on the East Coast at the moment. So uh, before we set up, I was nervously checking all my connections, hoping that uh, it doesn't sound any different than usual. But uh, but it's it's much earlier for you. I kind of appreciate you, uh, you know, taking one for the team here, starting earlier than normal. Oh, no, no. This is great. I got my cup of coffee. I'm just, you know, it's it's actually this is perfect for me. And it's not like we don't always do this. You are yeah. in the Bay Area. I'm down in Southern California. But it is. And it feels like more of a miracle for some reason this week, being on opposite coasts or something, but we're still having this seamless conversation. I don't know. I think if we were to just take a step backward, every part of it is a miracle, isn't it? Like, like just the, the fact that this show exists in the way that it exists. It wouldn't have been possible a certain amount of years ago. I mean, yeah, right. I mean, even less than we think. Uh, at least to the well, people can judge this, but uh, the quality I think that we, that we you know, of the output, you know, it it would have to be a recorded phone call. Yeah, I mean, so. people can go back and listen to the earlier ones. I would not recommend doing that, but but you can. Yeah. You can. Oh yeah. man, when I think about all the microphones and the failed microphones and the oh, <laughs> it's it's the void. It's just littered with artifacts yes, from the exactly. previous era. You know? Exactly. Yeah. You know, just obviously we don't we don't generally talk politics on this show, but I just as a historical marker, I want to point out that it, you know, the last time we recorded, we were coming out of the Republican convention and we kind of just touched on it, like oh yeah, and the the convention happened yesterday and there was Donald Trump's speech and there we go. And then in in you know, the the planets realigned ever since then. That's where right. The, the Democratic nominee, the incumbent president, stepped aside. We now have a new nominee. By the way, there was an assassination attempt a week before that. And, and you know, there's a saying uh, by, by Lenin, that's Vladimir, not John, who says there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. You're so right. I mean, I, you know, peek behind the curtain. We recorded a little bit out of order or got ahead of ourselves just to accommodate some of my travel here. And so you're right. I mean, history is just pages in in future history books are being written at rapid speed right now in real time, and it's pretty amazing. I'm glad you did bring that up. And I just want to say, hey, can can we not live in interesting times for a little while? Maybe? Can, <laughs> I, we, can we try think, that? Yeah, there needs to be a quote about there's only so many decades in a week that we can handle. <laughs> We've had many, it's... many weeks of this. <laughs> you know we're we're aging in interstellar years and <laughs> yes yes I wanna, and and right now i am like matthew mcconaughey watching that video i just <laughs> right, right just tears yeah. streaming down my face it's a lot but uh yeah as a historical marker i wanted to make sure that we situate where we are in time for for the aliens who discover this show yep, yep. In, amidst the wreckage <laughs> <laughs> and also welcome Hope you're enjoying the show. <laughs> uh, but what have you what have you been uh, watching? Anything you've been catching up on? Um, with the travel, not as much. But there were two things I thought I would mention right before I left. Uh, in the summers into the fall, out in uh, Los Angeles, this group called Cinespia will show movies at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. So it'll be, you know, a huge lawn is kind of roped off and people bring blankets and chairs and wine and cheese and picnic tables and whatnot. And then they beam a movie onto uh, the side of a mausoleum. And it's it sounds kind of grim, but it's it's really not. And my brother went for the first time recently and he even said every time I heard about this, I, I had a hard time imagining it. But then when you go, you're like, oh, this is just a really unique, cool event. And um Actually, I mean, I think I guess it's worth noting, uh, you know, you're not sitting among the tombstones like those are in a different area. You're not really supposed to be messing with those, but you can walk around before the show. And I had a lot of emotions, honestly. I mean, there's there's part of you that feels is this grim a little bit. But then on the other hand, I was like, no, I mean, it's it's sad that it happened, but it's almost beautiful that we're walking around and thinking of these people. Yeah, I mean, I don't I I, I don't think it's grim at all i mean that it 
it served the purpose that grave markers are supposed to serve, which is you see it and you remember that person. Yeah. And when I say grim, I mean, you know, throwing for all intents and purposes, a, a party or something among the tombstones. Mm-hmm. Maybe some people might feel weird about that, but it's funny, Dan, my brother, he said, uh, now understanding what it was, he's like, now I kind of want to be buried here. Cause I'll feel like I'm always a part of the, the event, <laughs> the action, you know, there's always going to be something going on around me, which is kind of nice. Um, but anyway, what we saw, and I just, I thought I'd mention this because I thought it was interesting, the facts regarding this movie, but we went, uh, a group of us went to go see Empire Records. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Going going back. Right? I think 1995. 95. And yep. uh, it's, you know, truly a day in the life of kids in a record store, the ups, the downs, everybody's got some sort of little business going on. And at the end of the day, it becomes a, we've got to save the record store kind of event. And uh, I hadn't seen it in a very, very long time. I remembered liking it. And we had a friend with us who had never seen it. And when it was over, all of us who had seen it were like, wow, what a nostalgia hit. You know, it's it's fun just seeing the 90s captured in the 90s, not something trying to evoke it years later. And um, but my friend was like, so what was that about? <laughs> you know? and, you do realize looking back on it, it is very choppy and there's a whole, even like a, a very saved by the bell sort of moment where you realize a character is taking speed and she's like, that's my speed. I need it. They're like, no, you don't. And then it's never remarked upon again. Um, and so I was a little curious and I did a little digging on the movie and it turns out that the original cut of that movie was 40 minutes longer, had two extra main characters who are nowhere to be found in the final cut. And originally wow. took place over two days versus one. Wow. And I just, is that fascinating? I mean, it really is. Because you look at it and it, it's lived on. It's become this cult classic and everybody loves it for what it is. But I, I thought of the filmmakers. If they look at it and they see it almost as a husk that they are thankful that people liked anyway. But a lot of their intention, that's a lot of it. 40 minutes, two main 40 characters. Mi- yeah, but I would say, I mean, that would put it at two hours and 10 minutes, which seems long to me i don't know i don't disagree bit, but and that's sort of what it's become is it is whittled down to it its barest essence yeah right maybe, so, maybe add back 20 of those 40 and see where you land that's what if I they say. work you know i i imagined them showing it to a test audience and people not latching on to the melodrama and being right, like i liked right. it when they were singing <laughs> you know or like i liked it when they were saying that they hate corporations and so then they're like well you know what let's just make a bop and and it worked. It worked for uh, audiences. And it's another one of those things that I didn't realize because it's so or become such a cult film. But it it didn't even make a million dollars in theaters. I mean, it made thousands. It was yeah, something that I, was kind of dumped. I believe and, that. Yeah, pulled from theaters. And but uh, anyway, I just the filmmaking part of it I found pretty fascinating. Just uh, yeah. I mean, what a cast though. God, like it's it's this fascinating mix of people who who have gone on obviously live Tyler um, uh, Renee Zellweger and stuff, but then like people who sort of like never quite broke through, you like know, even Embry. I mean, he certainly had moments, right? I mean, that thing you do. Right. And I think of Vegas can't vacation hardly wait. and can't hardly wait. Yeah. Yeah. He's Mr. Papa Giorgio. That's right. <laughs> um, Anthony La Paglia. Anthony La Paglia. Yeah. Yeah. Paglia. Yeah. I think of him from, so I married an ax murderer and, yeah, and he was the star of Without a Trace. Do you remember that show? I do, yes. You know, in in the wake of CSI, you had this sudden like mm. r- raft of CBS procedurals. This is one of them. It was like a missing persons unit. You're right, right. He's really good on that show. Yeah, right. You know, and it's funny, Robin Tooney. Yeah. And I was talking about her trying to get people to remember that she was in a mountain climbing movie. Oh, Nobody yeah. remembered that movie. It's called I, Vertical Limit. Vertical Limit, yep. Yeah, Martin and, Campbell. Uh, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's just one of those movies that's kind of disappeared off the face of the earth. I mean, it wasn't very good, I would say. No, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think it was memorable for me because I was working at a restaurant and it was one of the first bootlegs someone ever gave me. <laughs> and they're like, you want to watch Vertical Limit? And I was like, I do. That um, uh, might have been from us at the TV station. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, that's how I saw The Mummy with you. Yeah. Chris O'Donnell, right? Yep. Yeah, I should. I should. I mean, it's Martin Campbell, right? And I, I think if nothing else, there would be some craft there. Yeah, I would think so. That would make it worth a look. 
Um, and she was she was on Robin Tunney. She was on one of those other procedurals, The Mentalist. Oh wow! Okay, well, good for her. Yeah, I mean, she. Would, I, I like her. She's like you, you know you know you always have the procedural with the quirky guy who sees things differently crime solver guy. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then there's like the long suffering police person. <laughs> right. She right. was long suffering police person. Yep. It's like the person who's yes gets up on a table and stands on their head and it's like what is it now? Yeah, you're right, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's like a will they, won't they, you know, like, um, I'm, Brian, I'm telling you, man, I've said this so many times, we we need to just hunker down, put our heads together for an afternoon, come up with one of these procedurals. Yep, come up with an actor we kind of miss. Yeah, exactly. And and then and then just spend the rest of our lives sitting on on, a, on the front porch, sipping mint juleps, <laughs> ca- cashing them, them residual checks, you know? Ugh. The dream. <laughs> the dream. Um, actually, wh- while you mention Empire Records, I wanted to say, yeah, we talked about this in a previous episode, but the movie Fanboys. Yes. Um, yeah. After talking about it, I ended up being like, I'm going to rewatch that because I haven't seen it since it came out. What'd you think? Eh, it's not very good, is it? <laughs> That's unfortunately my memory. You know what's weird is it came out in 09 and it, even though it's set, like it's like a period picture. Yeah. The sensibility was out of date in 09. Yeah. I mean, can you define it better than I can at the moment? Because it is very of a specific moment of humor. I mean, it's very 99, 2000. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of got this like very, obviously very Kevin Smith, like heavy on the random pop culture reference drops right yes and almost like when they were putting those straight to dvd national lampoon movie kind of thing yeah yeah um like there's a scene where where these so for for those of you don't know it's about it's set in 99 it's about this group of kids who not even group of kids group of men who 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 are are big star wars fans and uh one of them turns out he has cancer so they decide to t- make a road trip to this is before the phantom menace comes out so they want to go break into skywalker ranch and see the phantom menace they have their friends see it before he uh, before he he loses his life potentially yeah. right and it's just it's so like i don't know man it's the the pop culture references like the really obvious like star wars lore drops like oh we're such like hardcore fans like mm-hmm. it got overwhelming after a while sure 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 right because i was just like i don't know that normal people talk like this and i don't know that it makes for appealing characters yeah yeah i, I know exactly what you're talking about but they're trying to hammer home like they probably did a pass where it's like they're not star wars fans enough so make every single thing they say, even checking the oil under their, you know, yeah. car hood has to be some sort of Star Wars reference. And it's a lot. Yeah. It, it doesn't Harry Knowles make a cameo in that? But it's not Harry Knowles. It's Ethan Supley. Oh, playing him? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And like Seth Rogen, like there's a scene where they oh, these guys yeah. come across a, a group of Star Trek fans. Yes. But like, I obviously they couldn't like clear like... They didn't have permission to use like Star Trek iconography. Mm. So they're wearing these like knockoff Star Trek things, you know? Oh, that's fun. And William Shatner's in it too, right? Yeah, William Shatner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of whatever. Yeah. Any, I mean, I could, we had talked about it on the show and I was like, you know, it's been a while. Maybe I'll check that out. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Yeah. So, I'm sure it was made with passion. I do believe that. But we, we also said that felt like a, a Weinstein interference kind of situation also happening. Right. But that- yeah. It, like, like we said, it, I mean, he, he got his fingers in the pie and, and they, the, the director who, whose name escapes me at this moment, but he, he was able to get, get it back to somewhat closer to his vision. But, uh, and, and like Kevin Spacey is one of the producers, <laughs> Oh wow! which I don't even know how that works. And, and like, Basically, Harvey Weinstein told Kevin Spacey, I want you to put out a statement in support of me saying that I'm a Jedi master. Right, right, right. I remember this. And you say so there's some there's some interview where Kevin Spacey's like, and yeah, Harvey Weinstein's a Jedi master. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like a 
hostage video where he's yeah basically because like everybody was shitting all over harvey weinstein i can't imagine why remember when all he got shat on for was interfering with movies yeah yeah that, that seems like a, a whole different time you know mm-hmm. um yeah so there you go it, 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 speaking of harvey weinstein it's very funny to me that that you know this past weekend was was a, a comic-con and they had a panel for the penguin uh, TV show this co- the uh, the the HBO show right and Matt Reeves said that Harvey Weinstein inspired his take on the Penguin. You know, I kind of see it. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, it it's funny to me that we're at that stage of of Harvey Weinstein's uh, super villainy, where now you can just say that like in public out loud. Yeah. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Because he was right. so uh, protected. Is that the right word for so long? Yeah. But he uh, sort of lived in fear of him or, or his mm-hmm. path or come award season. Now he would get your movie to fail and puff his movie up. And yeah, I mean, he, yeah, yeah, he had a reign there for a while. He really did. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you see anything else? I saw one other movie I wanted to mention, uh, sort of in the vein of uh, Ghost Light. Uh, oh, okay. You know, Brian's slow jams. <laughs> movies. Um, I was on the airplane flying to New York and I was looking for something to watch. And I saw this movie called Perfect Days, which I had yeah, heard of. V- Vim Vendors. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know that I'd seen any of his other movies. Paris, Texas. Um, actually, I, I'm super, I'm not very familiar with them, to be honest. But I had heard of this movie and I knew people liked it and I knew it was kind of a slow jam, but I thought this is perfect. Here I am on the airplane. Let's see what this is. And it's essentially about uh, a man in Japan and he cleans the public toilets. And that's kind of it. And so when it begins, you experience a day in the life with this person and it's very you know he gets up he folds up his cot he puts on his jumpsuit he buys the same coffee every morning and you're following this guy and it's very i found it very captivating because he uh the actor playing him uh, oh i don't have him right in front of me um koji yak uh yakusho he's just really it reminded me so almost of the performance Margot Robbie gave in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where it's just this person is just oh. floats through the film and yeah. is just a kind That's person and is observing the things around them. And, you know, just seeing someone smiling across the sidewalk will make them smile. And and he's just a really lovely person to spend time with. And so we follow him through the course of one day and then coming back and putting his jumpsuit back on the hook and reading a book and then turning off the lamp. And I looked out of curiosity and 30 minutes had passed. And I was like, wow, that's like a quarter of the movie. <laughs> um, but it's, it's so interesting. And it's interesting to see the way that he interacts with the world, with people. And then the rest of the film is him. What are the things that come through his day that, that change things and the people that he encounters and, uh, you know, some, someone who's related to him, someone who is indirectly in his orbit and someone that he might not, you know, likely have a lot to <laughs> in common with this person or know how to interact with them, but he still finds a way when this person is having a bad day to try to lift their day up. And it's just a absolutely lovely movie. I, it, it, it it's a slow burn. And I, I admit it, it, I wondered if I had been on my couch, if I might've checked my phone once or twice, but being on the airplane, watching it, mm. I think it's a brilliantly executed. It's paced the way it needs to be to really set you into the tempo of this man's life and how it's a little sad, but he finds the joy in all of it. He does a job that most people cleaning these, these public restrooms, you know, people even question, why do you, you don't have to do this. Why do you choose to do this? And he's doing it for reasons that are never explained, but he finds joy in the people that he encounters. And the, you know, there's a little moment where he finds a piece of paper with a tic-tac-toe board with an X on it. Hmm. He puts a no and then, you know, he puts it back and it sounds so small, but it becomes this thing. You start to look forward to this game with him (laughs) as, as he does it every day. And, um, by the end of it, I found myself, like I wasn't ready to leave. I wasn't ready to leave this world. It made me sad I was going to leave him. And I will also say, uh, we, we spoke about the movie Pearl, 
where that ends yes. with Mia Goth in a really unforgettable moment where the camera kind of lingers on her face. And yeah. what's what's happening with this gentleman is different, but it's another moment where we're on this guy's face for maybe about a minute and a half. And what he does is incredible. The <laughs> wow. things that he experiences, the ups and downs, and they don't feel not natural that he's slipping between this and that and whatever. It all it encapsulates everything we just witnessed and everything this guy must feel, but it ultimately ends with joy. And ah, it made me feel a lot. And I think for people that enjoy those style of movies, I, I highly recommend Perfect Days. Well, there we go. Yeah. Uh, but hey, let's take a short break. Yeah, we'll come back. We got some listener letters. And we're back, and hey, we, we've gotten a couple letters in the last couple weeks, Brian. Great. So here's a note we got from uh, Kelly Boucher, and this is in reference to our Twister commentary track for the original oh. film, the 1996 uh-huh. film. Uh-huh. Uh, and he says, hi, guys. The highest of high fives to Sean. Uh, Sean was our special guest for that commentary track. He says, I too love the original Twister. It's definitely in my top five of all time. I grew up in Kansas. I've spent many nights sitting in the basement, anxiously watching the TV, waiting for reported tornado sightings. When I was young, the only way we got locations of tornadoes was from storm spotters. Spotters were volunteers with ham radios that would drive around storm cells looking for funnels. So the idea of scientists developing better detection methods was a dream. For a Hollywood movie, Twister is pretty realistic. It looks like Kansas slash Oklahoma and captures that weird feeling that tornado nights have. I was first in line for Twister's opening weekend, and it definitely is punched up a notch and is less realistic, but I still loved it. At one point, I was leaning forward in my seat, trying not to yell out loud, Go, Kate, go! Finally, am I a Glenn Powell fan now? Yes. Yes, I am. (laughs) Thanks for all the great commentaries. I love them. Kelly. Oh, that's a great note. I love the the authenticity check there, you know, from someone who grew up experiencing those. I, 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 I think we talked about it a little bit. I saw a funnel cloud once and I, I mm-hmm. thankfully I didn't encounter a lot of tornadoes, but there is that weird eerie feeling, you know, with the sky turning green and the calm that happens before those types of storms hit. And uh, it's really interesting to hear Kelly comment on that and recognizing that in those films and speaking to the yeah. storm spotters. That's fascinating. Yeah, right? People just going out. I mean, you think about it now and just how advanced technology is, but to think it just, at one point we had to depend on people in trucks with radios saying, I, you know, nothing over here. Uh-oh, I see something over here. I mean, that's, that's what it was. I'm going to say, if those guys weren't trying to uh, shoot fireworks up the asses <laughs> of said tornadoes, uh, what are they even doing? I know, I know. That's me. Yeah. But if they didn't have uh, an avenue to film that and share it with people, was there even a point? Exactly. Right. Why <laughs> bother? YouTube. Why bother? Why bother? Uh, here's a note we got from Matthew Sharif as part of our ongoing letters from people recounting memorable theater going experiences. Uh, okay. Phantom Menace was the first Star Wars film I was alive for. Having been raised with the original trilogy, 11 year old Matthew was obsessed Young Jedi trading cards, lightsaber choreography, clip-on apprentice braid, the works. <laughs> Fast forward three years to 2002 for Attack of the Clones. I purchased opening day tickets for a 9 a.m. showing at AMC Mercado 20. My little brother, cousin, and mom being 14 without a cell phone and without Uber, mom was our only option. It so happens that mom had inventory day at work at Macy's in Valley Fair pre-Westfield, which meant she had to be at work from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. She was utterly miserable, hated the film, and hated taking us, and never complained once. This memory is a constant reminder to me of how important and influential Star Wars is and always will be to kids, no matter what we think of the new films as adults, and also a constant reminder of what our mothers will do for their children. Love you, Mom. May the Force be with you always. I love that story. That's a good story. Thank you for that, Matthew. And then here's a note we got from Charles Landy, who says, Hey, Brian and Zachy, just wanted to take some time to respond to the question you guys posed a while back about memorable theater experiences, and what better way to do it than with a story about Indiana Jones? Hey. 
When I was a kid, my dad used to let me skip school to see all the big early summer movies on opening day. Star Wars, indie, that sort of thing. When Temple of Doom came out on May 8th, 1984, I had just turned 11. Raiders of the Lost Ark had bitten me hard three years earlier, and I was very excited to see what was next for Indiana Jones. However, I was also a little cautious because I'd heard about how scary and violent it was in the early reviews, which was, of course, something I watched and read like gospel. Heart ripping, monkey brain eating, all that good stuff. I did not like scary movies at all, but I wasn't about to miss an Indiana Jones movie because of it, not by a damn sight. So my dad takes me out of school on opening day. We get to the theater, buy our tickets, and head in. We must have been early that morning because when we walked in, there was no one else in there. A completely empty room. Hmm. At 11 years old, I'd never seen such a thing before, and I distinctly remember how completely terrified and thrilled I was at the idea of getting to see the new Indiana Jones movie in a completely empty theater with no one else but my dad. I remember him leaning down and whispering in my ear, there's nobody else here. I stepped over my jaw and walked in behind him for protection. Of course, (laughs) we took our seats and for a good 10 minutes, the theater remained completely abandoned except for the two of us. As we waited there in that darkened room, I remember saying to myself over and over again, temple of doom is not going to be scary. Temple of doom is not going to be scary. Temple of doom is not going to be scary. Other people eventually came in and sat down around us, but those 10 minutes that crept by like hours are something I'll never forget. I miss those skipped school day mornings with my dad, like few other things from my childhood. I wasn't like the other kids or most of the other people for that matter. I was out and about with my dad doing something cool. My first movie in the theater was probably Star Wars or Superman the movie, but I don't remember hardly anything about seeing those at all. But those 10 long minutes spent sitting in the dark, having a nervous breakdown before Temple of Doom started to roll and burn itself into my psyche for good. Well, I'll remember those forever. Thanks for letting me share. As always, love the show. Take care. Charles Landy. I love that. I lo- is that. <laughs> I always love when people can remember those unique feelings you have when you're younger that you kind of forget about. Mm-hmm. You know, like having a genuine fear about a film, like hearing a movie scary <laughs> and thinking like, will this be, will I die? <laughs> Is this too scary for me? You know, and then even like a, an empty theater feeling like a scary place for a movie that you are thinking might be scary. You know, that's, ah, I love, I love that stuff. I forget some of these things. So it's nice to be reminded of those young feelings. Yeah. It's great, man. Folks, we, we love these stories. Send us these stories. Love them. Love them. Uh, Thank you for that, Charles. Thank you, everybody who wrote in. Let's take another short break. And boy, we got some headlines to discuss. (laughs) And we're back. And as we record this, we are coming off of the San Diego Comic-Con weekend. Yes, we are. Might as well just call it uh, Marvel News Weekend. I was going to say, I, you know, being uh, out here, I wasn't following it super closely. So I was uh, hoping to lean on you for this. And even beforehand, I I hopped on the Internet to see what the big stories were. And I feel like I kind of heard everything, actually. (laughs) Now, have you you've been to Comic-Con? I have. Yes. It's Uh, probably been a minute since you've been. Yeah, I went the I want to say it was 2012. Um, I remember the Dark Knight Rises was the big thing, and I saw the Tumblr, and actually had a badge um, uh, for this year. Oh wow! But I, I wasn't able to go. But uh, yeah, I haven't been in a while. Have you been? I've never been, and my, and my kids are asking me, "Oh, do you want to go?" And I'm like, you know, I I don't know that I feel like navigating just a sea of humanity. It's it's both. I feel both because. I do remember having a great time because I didn't do the Hall H thing. I wasn't standing in a lot of lines. I was just getting to see all the awesome cosplayers, see all the amazing displays, all the art, you know, picking up the free stuff people are handing out. So, and at the same time, yes, do I really want to figure out how to get down there from Los Angeles? Do I really want to figure out how I'm going to get back? It's a long, long day. So yeah, it's kind of a, a seesaw in my mind about wanting to do it. Yeah, it, we, we used to have uh, WonderCon up here, and and I know I've I've harped on this before, but but you heathens stole it from us. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. y- now it's in Anaheim. Used to be in San Francisco, and and I liked that. That was like the proper amount. Uh, that it wasn't a sea of humanity; it was a lake of humanity. And I yeah, feel like I yeah, that. more maneuverable. Felt yeah, yeah. I agree. I and, agree. And, and you know, there used to be plenty of big stuff here. You know, like. Uh, uh, 
you know, it, it, it was because it, I don't know when it happens now, but it used to be first quarter of, of the year. Mm-hmm. And so it would be kind of the sneak preview before Comic-Con had like the, the big, the, the bigger reveals, you know? Right. So I remember the first time they showed footage anywhere from Iron Man was here at WonderCon when, when John Favreau, um, I think you were you were were you were you here for that one? I was just going to say I think I was going to say do, do you remember seeing Iron Man stuff because I I remember yeah. that yeah with you. Okay. That yeah. was the first time anywhere hit they had just shown footage. Yeah, I think because my boss at the time she had a movie that was going to have a panel. Yeah, was it Shutter? Shutter, yes. Yeah. Yeah, US right. remake of Shutter. So we were all up there for that reason and that was cool. That was a lot of fun getting to hang out with you up there. Yeah, that that I remember that's like they ended up not doing anything for the dark Knight because Heath Ledger had just passed away. Ah, right. You know, but I remember a couple of years earlier in Oh five, you know, Christian Bale had come for Batman begins. I mean, it was, it was great. You know? So my first several years that I lived in the Bay area, I went to WonderCon just about every year. Yeah. Uh, but that's gone now. But anyway, Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't need to eat my feelings about that because we got San Diego comic-con used to be about the comics it's mainly about the movies and and uh obviously marvel studios this weekend has the win that it's back given the movie that opened we'll talk about that in a little bit but uh a lot of news which came out of this centered around the return of of one uh, robert downey jr yes to the mcu so how about this so he's not playing he's not playing uh uh, uh tony stark as one might expect mm-hmm uh, instead they, they got him lined up. He, he he's, he's the pinch hitter <laughs> to, to fill the Kang slot. If yeah, that's right. I know. I kind of wish they would have cast him as Kang, but he would play him as his character from Tropic Thunder. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't even know how to respond to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that this would be, be funny to talk me. about swings. That would be a <laughs> swing. That would be a real test. That would be a real test of what Marvel <laughs> is capable of. Wait, wait and see what we got lined up. And <laughs> You're right. right. <laughs> okay, so so for those of you who who've been living under a rock for a while, the plan had been that we had two Avengers movies in the offing. We just talked about this in our last episode. Uh, Avengers six was going to be a, a Secret Wars, and that was going to be a big culmination for whatever they got cooking right now. But the one before that was going to be called the Kang Dynasty, and it was going to be a reflection of of this Kang fella, played by Jonathan Majors, who had been building up slowly o- over the years. Last time we saw him, he got his ass kicked by a bunch of ants in yes. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Right. But 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 he was, he was hot shit, according to Marvel, right? And then, of course, Jonathan Majors got into some trouble uh, uh, and and they cut ties. So so the movie underperformed, mm-hmm. and then a couple weeks later he gets into to legal trouble. And so uh, Disney's like, you know what? Let's just let's just cut bait. Mm-hmm. And the question had been, are they gonna? So what happens with the Kang Dynasty? Are they gonna recast Kang? No. Instead, they they decided to 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 erase the 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 dry erase, shake up the etch a sketch. <laughs> Insert metaphor. <laughs> and now Avengers 5 is going to be Avengers Doomsday, the villain of which will be one Dr. Doom. And like we said, he'll be played by Robert Downey Jr. That's a lot to process. I mean, going back just a little bit, saving the most exciting stuff. I mean, I think it's awful what happened in real life with Jonathan Majors and all those things. So yeah. I don't want to, you know, not think about that but you all strictly thinking entertainment movies business whatever you think marvel's a little like maybe we uh dodged a bullet there in terms of you know even in deadpool itself mild 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 spoiler they even referenced that mcu is in a bit of a slump at the moment Mm -hmm. and i don't know that kang would hit the same way that this i don't even know how this is gonna hit but i know it's gonna hit Right. We know people are going to show yeah. up for this. It'll probably be good. Probably. But just the curiosity factor alone, getting this bigger, more well-known villain, getting the hugest star in the MCU back, you know, like they, they really life gave them the opportunity to pivot and they pivoted hard. Okay. So, so a couple thoughts on this. 
here's the thing. Kang, the character, is a cool character. I mean, just from the comic books, he's a cool character. Uh, Kang, as portrayed in the film, I thought was a cool character. In Ant-Man, right? for me. In, in Ant-Man, I thought he yeah. was a good villain, you know? Yeah. Uh, not with, I mean, the movie was, 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 was not good, but I thought he was fine. I thought Jonathan Majors was fine interesting in the movie. and he was different. He was different than, than he was right. And, and I think the problem more than anything was the fact that they were like, oh, this is where it starts. This guy, he's going to be the next Thanos, you know? Mm. And it's like, yeah, but like, like when you think about it, the first time we really saw Thanos as mm. as uh, a force within the story was Infinity War, right? Because because before Infinity War, he has like the the little cameos, uh, like the li- the little you know post credit tags in the first two Avengers movies, and he has like a scene in Guardians of the Galaxy, right? And that's it. Yeah, yeah, right. So so you y- right away you're setting the bar in a way that that's unfortunate, right? Yep. And that's the first time that has happened. Right? As an audience, as yep. this is happening through the years, we're like, is this is this leading to is this building to what will that be like? Right? This is all yes. new. Right. Right. Nothing to compare so, it to. Yeah. So so just to be clear, I think I think it's good to be able to make a switch. Mm-hmm. Like if if your strategy's not working, then yes, you should adjust. Mm-hmm. There's no sense, you know you know, riding the plane until it crashes. Right. Right. Uh, the question is, is, as far as, as bringing in Downey now, now the backstory here is Marvel approached him. I would assume shortly after he won his Oscar mm-hmm. and he was always playing coy. If you remember like, Oh, would you return to Marvel? He's like, yeah, I'm open to it. And remember we, mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. we, we even talked about it in our last episode. I'm like, he's not dumb. I and I would assume, given this new information, he was probably in talks with Marvel. Yeah, while he was making his his Oscar run, right, right, right. So, so this this pivot had to have been in the works f- from from the time Quantumania came out, right, right. Uh, but but they get Downey on board. They offer him uh, several king's ransoms. <laughs> I mean, he's making out like a bandit. I was just looking at at Variety, and and um, he, I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, they, they list I don't the even remember Russo brothers' uh, salaries, but they just say that Downey Jr. is making more. <laughs> it's basically there. There you go. And well, this is interesting. So, so yeah, we buried the lead there. So the Russo brothers are coming back for Avengers five and six. Now we, we were talking before uh, they had re- Destin Cretton was going to do Avengers five. He left and then they asked Sean Levy. He said, no, thanks. And then ultimately they got the Russos back on board for, for both of them. We talked about this last time, but mm-hmm. the interesting thing to me is that they came back at the behest of Robert Downey. Right. Right, that was his condition, right, to return. Yeah, he said, "I will only work with them," which that's kind of interesting to me. Yeah, that's great. I mean, obviously right? they 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 pulled it off. They pulled off everything that we all fell in love with. But it's nice to know that it was a clearly satisfactory, creatively satisfying experience for Downey Jr. So much right. so that those are the guy; those are his guys. So, so just going uh, cycling back to what you were saying about about the the salaries involved. Um, this is this is courtesy of of Variety. It says Marvel is plunking down eighty million for Anthony and Joe Russo to direct Avengers: Doomsday and Avengers: Secret Wars, and significantly more for Downey <laughs> to tackle Uber villain Doctor Doom and the Two Tentpoles. The Russo's deal doesn't include back end compensation, but it does contain performance escalators that kick in at the seven hundred and fifty million and one billion dollar thresholds. Wow. So those are, in other words, those are the expectations for these things, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, so a couple things here. First of all, uh, the the reveal of Downey came at the tail end of the Marvel panel, which included uh, a little bit about Captain America: Brave New World, which, in answer to my question last time, will indeed have Harrison Ford playing the Red Hulk, and uh, the crowd at the Comic Con saw it, and it is indeed a Red Hulk with Harrison Ford's face, <laughs> which I, I'm. That sounds hilarious to me. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Did you see it? I have not seen it. But okay, 
Yeah, it's, but I I, yeah. I respect Harrison Ford being all in on doing that because I saw him come out and doing his you know screaming and yelling and I'm like, hey man, he's there, he's loving this, it's good. You know, it's so funny. He is like such a an interesting guy. There's so many sides to this person because he has the eye rolly side to mm-hmm. all of this, and yet he participates in all of it. You know, and he he does it, and he does his job. He shows up, and he gives it a hundred percent. So that I kind of love that. I, I I I would really love to know the true Harrison Ford and what he really. I think I think what he it. has said is that the 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 selling of the movie that's part of the job. Sure, that's part of what you're paid for. So you you do your job. Mm-hmm. But what what can bring him into? A, a, a juggernaut like this like why why would he want to enter into this universe when he's just left the other universe that people are obsessed with and asking him silly questions about for the rest right of his life? you know what i mean <laughs> well i mean according to him per him you know i was watching all these other great actors have having fun and you know i wanted to have some fun too and i say maybe <laughs> <laughs> i hope so I, think I would love that i i'm sure that's a part of it has to you know yeah uh i would say well he's never done mocap so maybe it's just a chance to do something different right sure uh the other thing let's be honest you know i'm sure they made it worth his while oh i'm sure that buys a lot of airplane fuel (laughs) for sure (laughs) (laughs) yeah um but that that one i am i am very excited about uh I, i i didn't say this last time but you know tim blake nelson is the villain he plays the leader Mm. and this is a character who who was teased in the Incredible Hulk in 2008. Wow. Right? So he's 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 in that movie and you see him begin the metamorphosis into this character who was pres- you know presumably was meant to show up in a Hulk sequel which never happened, but he's just been sitting on the bench for 16 years and don't you love that? Yeah, yeah. It's all there. It's all like, on the that's board. What, it, that's what they can do. That's what you can do when you have this this extended game that you play, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but but they they had a little bit about about the Thunderbolts and 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 again probably biggest question mark remains that one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't know. I just I don't know how to fully articulate my feelings about it. But when I saw that, it's like the Rooster Brothers are back. Robert Downey Jr. is back. It's a villain that even I know again. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> oh they they were headed in a direction and life took them that way. Maybe their smarts caught up with them or they're, you know, they, they let go of the hubris a little bit and we're like, we need to make a drastic pivot. And they secured themselves those, those bumps, <laughs> the Russo brother bumps at 750 at 1 billion. You know what I mean? Like I well, think the I, Kang I, thing would probably get that high. This will get that high. I mean, this is some, this is an event again, you know? Exactly. Right. That was my thought. Cause even just going back to what I was saying about the Thunderbolts, I was like the, the, the fact that that one, is presumably going to, you know, lay stuff in place for the Avengers, which uh, the 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 Avengers five, that's going to get people to show up for that, right? So there's going to be this kind of, uh, kind of a, a cascading effect flowing outward. I think so. It reminds me of Captain Marvel, actually, because I remember my parents yes. going to see Captain Marvel, saying it was like they felt like they needed to do their homework before <laughs> the Avengers movie. Oh, and and of course we should mention, you know, the Fantastic Four cast was there also there was like a little they showed kind of a sizzle reel of of uh concept art and whatnot from the fantastic four and that that movie starts shooting like today i think as we record this but the cast oh, flew wow. out really quickly to to glad hand yeah and they're going to be in the avengers movies right yes i think that was said yeah and they, uh, they said the it, it was stated that the movie exists in like an alternate 1960s where the space race went differently and it's it's kind mm. of like a uh, kind of retro future they've described it as i love that that feels different i'm very Something excited different. about that yeah yeah well uh, can the, i ask you then i yes well, sorry we're talking about uh, well multiverses we're going to talk a lot about that in, in a little bit uh so how do you then uh, explain robert downey jr playing victor von doom when we we know him best, he has launched one of the most successful film enterprises in movie history as yeah. another character. What 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 do you think this is going to be? 
Well, it's interesting. I've, I've sort of like, I heard the news about this and I was like, huh, okay, interesting. And that was literally the extent of my reaction. And then over the next 36 hours or so, I was just sort of glancing at social media and seeing folks having a totally normal one. A lot of gnashing of teeth and rending of garments. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm never in favor of that because it tends to be that they have a, a solution for that before they announce these things. <laughs> you know, they right. kind of know what they're doing. Yeah. At the same time, yes, like he is the biggest hero, I would say, probably in the MCU. You know, the hugest impact, that that face, Robert Downey Jr. So how do you imagine then in this they're going to, like, will, will characters recognize his face? Will he be a well, that's from the another universe? Will he that's be, the question, know? right? Yeah, because obviously this is not, what's funny is at one time, Kevin Feige was like, the rule in the MCU is we're not going to have uh, one actor play multiple roles. Oh, okay. Like this isn't going to be like law and order or something where you have like, you know, random people pop up as, as either defense attorneys or criminals in different episodes. No, once you have an MCU role, that's it. And I'm like, well, they sure pivoted hard from that. Didn't they? Yeah. You went all the way in the other direction. Right. Uh, my, my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law said this would be like Mark Hamill playing Darth Plagueis. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, yeah, that's pretty apt. Right. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. I, I feel like the Russos said, you know, anything is possible in the multiverse. And so here's our Victor Von Doom and out comes Robert Downey he pulls off the, the Dr. Doom mask and everybody goes ape shit. And, right. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like, let me tell what, what I would not want is for, for, Dr. Doom to be a Tony Stark variant. That just feels tacky to me. Sure. Yeah. Right. Like, I, uh, right. Cause, cause, uh, and not even because it like undoes, you know, Tony Stark's great sacrifice or whatever. It's not that it's just, I'm like Tony, I'm like Dr. Doom is a great character on his own. Mm-hmm. He doesn't like not, not everything, despite what the Spider-Man films say, not everything needs to be connected to Iron Man, you know? Right. Um, However, the thought I've had over the last day or so is maybe, maybe Downey just like wants to play a character, right? Like, I mean, he just won an Oscar for playing a guy who looks nothing like Robert Downey Jr. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe, I mean, you you know what I mean? Maybe this is just Downey playing a different character and he'll look different. He'll probably Mm -hmm. be wearing that mask most of the time. Right. And he'll have like a voice in it. I mean, you know, and I don't know a lot about Dr. Doom, but I mean, to your point, Robert Downey Jr. has a cadence, yes. right? He has a way of speaking that is very, he and Tony Sp- Stark are very similar, <laughs> you yes. know, sort right. of the way they joke and, and everything. And so, yeah, so maybe he'll be playing something entirely different. He won't be quippy. He won't be what we know. He wants to play a character, as you say. Right. Like, let me put it this way. Downey more than anyone else would be acutely aware of the value of mm. how he left, mm-hmm. how he left on Endgame, And I don't think he would want to sully that. Sure. Right. So the Marvel peeps probably went to him and they presented whatever their pitch was and he had to weigh it. Like, is this something I want to do that might have any kind of a negative effect on how how end game is perceived like he would know that yeah right so that's what's intriguing to me i don't think i don't think it's gonna be like oh wow he looks just like tony stark what are the mm-hmm. odds you know i i don't maybe i'm wrong i mean for all i know i'll sound like an asshole two years from now when this movie comes out I mean, it's hard to know i mean if you have tom holland's spider-man opposite this character we know what it's like to see those two in the same frame I mean, yeah. we'll be bringing that with us. And so, yeah, you just wonder if that's any, any of that is going to be present in the film itself or if it wants us to just not think about that at all. I think that, that Dr. Doom has been depicted various times as having a heavily scarred face. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Right. And, and otherwise he's wearing a suit of armor. So it'll be a voice role. It'll, it'll, he'll be Mandalorian it, you know, mm. that's my guess. Mm-hmm. Right. And again, you can't make Dr. Doom sound like Iron Man. I mean, the, it's just the, the characters are completely different. So that means Downey's going to have to find another lane. He is an actor. He is a great actor. Mm-hmm. 
So again, maybe that's that's what appealed to him. It was, hey, here's several Brinks trucks that we're going to be driving to your house every day for the next five years. Yeah, that aspect, and also you get to play a completely different character. Yep, and it's you know, I think it was from that same Variety article where they were saying from all his uh, participation in Marvel already, he's made it like four hundred, five hundred million dollars. Oh yeah. So I mean, he I doesn't mean, need it. So you've got to think there's some sort of hook that was irresistible to him. For that's this. that's my thought. So yeah. so they have him for the next two Avengers movies, and and maybe Fantastic Four, maybe like a cameo in that. Mm, that probably right, right? Because because so so Fantastic Four, the concept art shows Galactus, right? Who's the planet eating alien? Mm-hmm. And if if I were to guess, I would say that movie culminates in their world being destroyed mm. and then being shunted somewhere into the multiverse and then and then that's how they cross paths with 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 the the you know the the regular earth the, the mm-hmm. avengers earth yeah. if i were to guess yeah it makes sense you know uh but obviously dr doom is intrinsically tied to the fantastic four he's intrinsically tied to to reed richards so so what does that entail i don't know i'm 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 not reflexively blanching at the idea I I do have a, a lot of questions about it, but but mm-hmm. I I certainly don't think in any way this undoes the ending of Endgame, you know, which I thought was was meaningful. Mm-hmm. Um, any more than I don't I think you know Deadpool and Wolverine. I don't think that undoes the ending of Logan, obviously, you know. Right, right. Which which we'll talk about in just a second. Well, and they've got everybody uh, all Twitter again. You know, right? I mean, they got everybody really excited and counting down the days. Which, well, and I that's the people, funny thing because even right? the people who are who are just bitching incessantly, well, they're going to be there. They're going to watch it. They have to know, yeah. So Marvel got their money too. You know. Yep. Yep. So so coming up, we got uh, we got um, we got Captain America next February. We got Thunderbolts in May. Uh, um, oh, Fantastic Four. Mm-hmm. About a year from now, and then Blade is still on the calendar, as far as I know. We'll see how long that lasts. Mm-hmm. And then the only movie currently scheduled for for twenty twenty six is is Avengers Avengers five. You know, I mean, it has been kind of cool to yeah. take a step back from all this stuff, and it's made it yeah. more exciting then to show up for it. I think, and maybe. Yeah. Maybe they'll add something in there, but well, uh, I think a Spider-Man is probably going to get slotted in. Okay, I was going to say there could be something cool about making that the Marvel event of the year. Everybody will be thirsty for it. Yeah, I agree with that. But if I were to guess, I would say Blade gets gets kicked to twenty six, mm-hmm. and and probably we get a Spider-Man movie. Although nothing's been announced, but I'm assuming they'll they'll come to some kind of agreement for that. Sure, sure, you know. Very cool. Very exciting. Yeah, a lot, lot of stuff happening. I mean, his video, I was seeing it everywhere. It was just, you know, one moment, there was the moment before it, and then every single, you know, Instagram, Reddit, whatever, like all I saw was Robert Downey Jr. taking that mask off. I mean, it's 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 the real life version of the end of Iron Man, the first movie where he's like, I am Iron Man. And then like everybody, all the press stands up, you know, it's that's like happened in real life. Yep. And all the memes. <laughs> and yeah, it was really fun. I saw one meme. It's it's just a picture of him on the stage, and it says uh, the guy who sticks around the school three years after he graduated. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the one I loved was uh, related to the monorail episode of uh, The Simpsons, where Marge and the scientists go to a a town like North Haverbrook, where they, you know, want to find the remnants of the monorail in this clearly decimated town. This woman's like, there, there ain't no monorail, and there never was, and she slams down this. (laughs) you know visor that says monorail on it clearly has been there and then i saw this meme where it's that woman and she's like there ain't no king dynasty and there never was and she slams it shut and it says king dynasty on it king dynasty <laughs> oh poor king i know i mean um i, I, I yeah well pay king the character not king yes the, yes the actor <laughs> yeah, yeah. as a fan of the character i would say he, d- he deserved better but yeah, yeah, yeah. but su- such is life but yeah, it, um, just as interesting, I think, uh, completely separate from the Marvel news, is the total lack of DC news. Yeah. Well, did they release uh, or unveil a new logo? Is that a thing that happened? 
that that did happen. It it is the classic DC logo from the seventies, eighties, and nineties, which there that's now the DC Studios logo, and and it's it's like seeing an old friend, Brian. It reminded me of my action figures. That was what was on the box. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so Superman, uh, which is due to come out about a year from now, just just under a year from now, uh, has almost wrapped filming, but but James Gunn very. Uh, deliberately chose not to have a presentation at at Comic Con. No trailer, no nothing. And and uh, per, per him and per Peter Safran, they were like, you know what? A year is just too long for a marketing campaign. So let's mm-hmm. just, you know, at, at at the start of the year, we'll start we'll start rolling this thing out. Which which I when I heard that, I was like, yeah, that makes sense to me. But even more so now, in light of uh, all the Marvel news, I mean, just. Deadpool and Wolverine alone, they owned this weekend, yep. right? And then, yes, of course, this announcement. Anything else is going to be in the shadow of this announcement. Yep. Okay. Okay, man. Next year's going to be big, huh? It's going to be big. Yeah, it's it's been kind of a light year. I have enjoyed that. <laughs> Same. In, in terms of in terms of superhero stuff, because uh, our our big discussion for this episode, this is the first superhero movie all year. And you know what? I mean, without tipping it one way or the other, it uh, there was absolute energy in my theater and i really do yep. feel i mean the movie alone i i know generated some of that but also i think people were excited to to be in a superhero film again i i definitely agree with that yeah yeah um so hey let's take a short break we'll come back we will talk deadpool and wolverine and we are back and uh, you know who else is back brian Who's that, Zeki? Why, why, it's that wacky merc with the mouth, Wade Wilson, this time with Wolverine. Yeah, no, I saw this movie. It was like uh, over 10 years ago, right? Deadpool Origin, oh. or Wolverine Origin. <laughs> that's right. That's what, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> I've seen this team up before. The, the first appearance of Deadpool, yeah, that's that 15 years ago, if you can believe that. We watched that together. Do you remember that, X-Men Origins? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a shit yeah. show. That I mean, that was one of those things where, you, as we were watching, we were like, "No, no, no, this is not good." Yep, yep, yep. It it is amazing to me when when you think of that as the start of this whole thing. Yeah, that Ryan Reynolds was like, "There is a good version of this character that I can do, mm-hmm. and it will be worth it." And he had to he had to push this boulder uphill. Mm-hmm. And it has resulted in, like, uh, uh, just a truly iconic performance and character that are that are interlinked in a way that can't be separated. It's amazing to me. I mean, this really didn't this all start because he made test footage, and the studio turned him down, and so yeah. he leaked it himself yeah, because he right. knew everybody would eat it up. And then now you have this movie coming out doing things you never thought a movie could possibly do, you know, first of all. But then also, I I think I read worldwide, it made almost half a billion dollars opening weekend. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you think about Ryan Reynolds after Wolverine Origins or whatever it was called. And you know what I mean? Like thinking like, well, there goes my shot. But it's like, he exactly. He he, he persisted. He didn't. It's amazing. He, He knew he believed in it. And it he was right. So so let's run down very quickly a list of the records that have been broken by Deadpool and Wolverine. Okay. Uh, it is the highest rated, R, highest R rated opening of all time. Mm-hmm. Biggest global opening since Avatar The Way of Water. Biggest wow. domestic opening ever for Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman. Uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe is now the highest grossing film franchise of all time. Incredible. $30 billion at the box office incredible right uh the 34th consecutive mcu released to debut at number one that mcu has never not opened at number one wow um highest domestic opening weekend of 2024 highest since spider-man no way home in december 2021 number six highest domestic opening weekend of all time sixth highest opening day at the domestic box office 96 million in one day uh, no. Number four, number four highest. It, it, I, I got more, Brian. Yeah, no, please, please. <laughs> number four highest superhero opening weekend of all time. Number two highest opening weekend for a third installment of all time. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, and then it is, it is as of today the the biggest Monday of all time. 
Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, it made like 20, 20, 24, 25 million dollars yesterday. Uh, so that's a lot. And then there's more. I think the records are going to keep falling. I think I think uh, this will end up being probably uh, the highest grossing uh, X Men movie of all time. Sure, sure. When all of a sudden none, because there's all them records too. So it it is remarkable. And and just to c- circle back to what you were saying before about the a- energy of the crowd. Uh, this was my audience. I don't know if it was, I, I saw the 3 PM shows like the first show opening day. I think you saw the same one. Yeah, I did. Yeah. 3 PM. Cause you texted me as I was walking in, you were like, Hey, have you seen Deadpool and Wolverine yet? I just saw it. Yeah. So I was like, okay. yeah, cause I'm three hours ahead of you. Yeah. We, yeah. it's weird. Like a weird time <laughs> loop kind of thing. Um, as soon as the Marvel logo music started, the crowd started applauding. That was my audience. Oh man. I, well, I almost was going to see it today. Uh-huh. Just with the schedule I have going on out, out here and thought we would record in like two days or something. But I was like, no, 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 no. I want to see this with the crowd that is just has to be their opening day. Yeah. And I'm so glad I did. I mean, it was, yeah, it was 3 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon, sold out, you know, every seat, everybody, mm-hmm. like the guy next to me, he kept pumping his fist the whole movie. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, and I clapped, I laughed out loud. I clapped several times. I mean, it was just yeah, it was electric, and it was very exciting to to be in that crowd. So it's been it's been uh, six years since the last movie. Mm-hmm. So clearly the the demand was there. I I th- I think I was thinking about. It. I was like, obviously Wolverine is is a an important value added element, but I feel like the demand would have been there if it was just Deadpool. Honestly, I think so. I mean, I don't know that it would be to this degree. No, for sure. But I, I think it would have been a huge hit. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I, I yeah, uh, sorry, real quick. I have to give props to Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman hitting up every like, <laughs> you know, stop and talk venue. Yeah. Hot ones. But, I haven't watched that yet, but I want to. <laughs> I mean, they hosted Jimmy Kimmel live. You know? oh, did they really? <laughs> yeah. Um. So it's, it, you know, they, they, they knew the assignment. I mean, they, it was like just complete cultural penetration you know right right and it did the trick yep yep well i I, the thing i was going to say earlier that i still kind of want to comment on and i'm not totally versed in this lore but i do know that kevin feige began as kind of an executive level person right or or even like an assistant is that right he was like lauren Schuler donner's assistant yeah and where he thought it was very important that these people playing the x-men characters be familiar with the comics and who these characters actually are right to the point where I think comics were banned on those sets and he was sneaking comics on. Correct. Yeah. So Brian Singer it. had like a no, no comic book rule. Cause he wanted to play it completely straight. Mm-hmm. And, and Hugh Jackman who kind of had to hop onto a moving train. Cause the movie had already been filming for like three weeks when he jumped. Uh, people forget he was the second choice. Mm-hmm. And I've said this before. Sometimes you're people's second choice and that's okay. Mm-hmm. It's, it's worked out all right for him. You know, uh, but yeah, I said, he's like, yeah, who's the character? And, and Kevin Feige was, it, it, it was like, you know, he, he was like his comic book dealer, you know? Yeah. And so Sli- the person who believed issues. in the material, like he was not ashamed of the material. He wanted to celebrate the material and under his leadership, $30 billion. Amazing. $30 billion. I mean, that's just something to really, there's like a lesson there. <laughs> you know what I mm-hmm. mean? Like believing in your product. Well, that was the issue, really, right? Because because X Men, and I don't know if people can appreciate what a game changer that was when it came out, right? Uh, you know, I, I've, I don't, I haven't said on this show, but I mean, you know, Sean and I, we recorded a commentary track for the original X Men a couple of years ago, and we talked about going to see that opening day, and he and I, that was like one of our first connections. We were both big X Men fans when we were in high school. Mm. And I remember, bef- you know, this is before, or, you know, reserved seating and stuff. We went to the, the Cantera and uh, that morning, so we were going to go see it at night. We went in the morning to get our tickets, both of us together. And I remember telling him, I was like, did you ever think we'd be over here mm-hmm. buying tickets to watch an X-Men movie? You know? Right, right. And we that night, th- there were lines going out the door. Right. And I was like, oh, this thing's going to be big. I don't think people realize how big it's going to be. You know? And right. at the time, it opened to $55 million. Which like right. sounds like, right. <laughs> so so half of the opening day of, of Deadpool and Wolverine, you know? Yep. 
but it was a big deal, you know? And, and so really, I mean, you had blade two years before this, but it was really X-Men that was like, Oh, we can, we can do this with our marquee titles, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, Kevin Feige was there. He was on the ground floor and he, he gets to he, he claim a little, little, little piece of that, you know, maybe not an insubstantial piece of that. Certainly that, but I also just love that when it was under his leadership, he didn't shy away from. Yeah. Well, I, and I think know, he took that lesson. He's like, why, yeah. why not? Why not mm-hmm. lean into it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Let, uh, let your flag fly. I mean, this is why people are here for these characters who they love. Why would you try to turn them into something else? And that's the funny thing. Cause in, in the first X-Men movie, you've got, Hugh Jackman all duded up in the black leather kind of matrix looking thing. And, you know, it's the famous, you know, he's like, you people go outside in these things and you have Cyclops is like, what would you prefer? Yellow spandex. Right. right, right. Ha, 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 ha. And, and I think about that now where at the time, everyone in the audience laughed at that. Mm-hmm. And it was sort of like, yeah, cause costumes are silly. Ha ha ha. Right. Right. S- s- say all the fans in the audience, you know? Right. And yet, uh, what does this movie show? He looks awesome. (laughs) I know. know. Right? Like, I mean, that's the thing. It's like uh, either you own it or you don't. But, but, but like that, that sense of like, and the movie even says it, right? It took 20 plus years for him to wear the yellow costume. That seems a crime in hindsight, you know? I know. And then at the same time, you do have to consider. You know, maybe you guys aren't ready for that yet, but your kids are going to love it. You know, like maybe <laughs> culturally it would have been a huge leap in that moment. Maybe not. You know, I mean, the people, the fans would have shown up, but maybe we did have to inch a little bit. And then once the, you know, the toe was dipped and it's like, oh, people are going to to do this. We could go whole hog with it, you know? Well, and, and t- just, to, just to add to what you're saying, I mean, the first time they showed Deadpool, he looked like whatever the hell he looked like in that X-Men Origins movie. Uh, yeah. Right. Because they were I guess they were like, oh, if we put him in his his red suit, it's going to look ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And and I think really the, the you know, what the MCU showed is, look, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a verbatim translation of the, the comic book costumes, but it should evoke them in a way that feels like a natural progression. Right. So mm-hmm. so look at look at, um, you know, in Captain America, the first Avenger, right? He's wearing that. USO costume, which is pretty much his comic book costume, right? Right. But then they put him in something that's a little more, you know, armored and whatever. It still looks like Captain America. Right. I think that's the trick, and that's what the MCU has done very well, right? Right. Uh, but regardless of all of that, uh, I think the the enthusiasm of the crowd sure puts to rest any notion of the MCU being dead or dying or what have you. I mean, yeah, these are people... They 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 want this. I, this is like it's such an interesting movie too. Like this movie also, I was thinking a lot about. I don't know if it would have made sense ten years ago. You like you're this right. is the perfect movie for this moment right now. You know, <laughs> like just with everything, with where we were with Fox superhero films, where we are with Marvel superhero films, where we're going with Marvel superhero films. Like this is just that amazing little window where they could make this goofy movie. Yeah. And have it hit the way that it does, you know, or even, you know, post Logan. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's such I just, a good point. That's such a yeah. good point. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's aimed so completely at the existing audience. Like, I don't know that there's an on ramp in this movie to anybody who's not at least somewhat familiar with the world it exists within, you know, you know, it's funny you say that because I mean, I mean, I, I think people can tell I, I really enjoyed this movie a lot. Um, and I also would have to say that it's not a traditional movie in a narrative <laughs> sense. Like this is a mad magazine article of a movie. Right. You know what I mean? Like this is, yeah, I, like a- I was, I was going to say it's a mystery science theater of a movie, but yeah. 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 And, and, and which is amazing. It's well, I think it's worth noting because I think if some people have missed a couple movies or just think they're going to see the next Marvel movie, they might find themselves kind of confused if they're like, oh, I'm going to see Marvel movie number 48. What's this one about? You know, like this is not that movie. But what I love is that it's so wholly unique and special. 
that this thing yeah. can exist because of everything that came before it and the mood everybody is in right now. And even it plays even they even comment on it. The, the, the lull at the moment with Marvel, like it's the shot in the arm. It kind of needs to <laughs> remind you of all the things that you've loved and where we've come and how far we've come. And we can comment on that and have a good time with it. And like, let's just kick back and like you say, like the, the science theater of it all, like let's put our feet up on the chairs and comment on it as we're yeah. watching it and have fun with yeah. that. And then let's go. Let's let's keep going. Then fant- bring on Fantastic Four. You know, I think that Deadpool is uniquely positioned as a character just because he sort of exists in this you know fourth wall constant fourth wall break, where you know you have without spoiling anything, you have at one point somebody makes a reference and he's like, "Oh, you mean like Loki season one episode five? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and the reference itself is funny. And sort of commenting on the need to for people have to do, having to do homework and the frustration there, like all of it is perfectly encapsulated in this character. Mm-hmm. And then I would add that, and this is Hugh Jackman said this, like what what got him to come back, and and he said, you know, when he when he watched Deadpool, having just announced I'm done after Logan, and he watches the movie and he pictures kind of the the um, the planes, trains, and automobiles with these two characters Mm -hmm. that that was the appeal. And, and I think, I think he really nailed it because I think Deadpool who I I always, I don't have a problem with the character, but I think he, he works best when he has kind of a straight man to play off. Right. So in the previous movie, it was cable that's made it work. And then this especially, and we'll get into it in spoilers, but the, the dynamic between them is, is what makes it fun. I've seen the movie twice now and, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it both times and I just enjoyed seeing their, their interplay, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. You know, and that's the thing too. I think I've seen it once. I'll, I'll probably try to see it again while it's still in theaters. But it's there's so it's dense. It's a dense mm-hmm. movie filled with jokes and references and and all sorts of things. And actually, I it's worth mentioning. I went to a theater I didn't know. I didn't quite understand where the seats were, and so and it was really full. So I was like, you know what? I'll just sit in the back row. That's fine. I just mm-hmm. I always want to sit where I can see the four corners of the screen. That's my thing. Mm-hmm. And um, that was a bit of a mistake because really? I was right next to the speakers oh. for the surround. And I noticed during the trailers, the sound effects and music was drowning out the dialogue uh, speaker with where I was oh. seated. So it wasn't terrible during the movie, but I would hear Reynolds saying something and people laugh. And I was like, oh, I didn't get that. I, I oh, no. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, it didn't ruin the experience, but I, I thought it would be fun to see it again. Just I'm sure there's things I would have missed anyway. But yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so it's it's a it's an un, un, unquestionable thumbs up from me and i'm assuming it's the same for you yeah and i, I mean i also want to to note i guess what we had already referenced but i a, a friend of mine did not really enjoy herself with the movie and i can kind of get that honestly yeah. i think it really is a really really specific thing and i don't think the story really matters you know, I mean, there's there's some stakes because there has to be stakes, but <laughs> I had even questions about the stakes. I was like, wait, what? And yeah. but it's really more of, yeah, like put your feet up, throw the popcorn in your mouth, laugh with the fact that you have seen all these movies they're referencing, that you are an Internet nerd and you've been following movie news for the past 20 years and they're referencing the things you thought only you were following. Right. Um it's just it's weird it's weirdly more of a very specific celebration for two hours right, I, sure yeah definitely agree with that. um and so i can see why maybe that might not resonate with some people and i can see why that would really resonate with other people um yeah. but you know like you were saying i i i had a good time i felt relaxed i just got to like laugh <laughs> along at all the references that i'm finally being rewarded for having in my brain <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah um, you want to talk spoilers? Let's do it. Spoilers. So, uh, before the movie came out, so I, I was going to take my older two boys. So they're they're uh, uh, almost sixteen, almost eighteen. So that's in terms of age range. In case people are like, "Wow, you're a terrible parent," so <laughs> I think I think that's okay. But but uh, I had 
said to them, I was like, hey, you know, we should watch uh, Logan because mm-hmm. uh, they hadn't they hadn't seen Logan. That's the only one they haven't seen. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hey, you know what the hell? And 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 n- me, I had no idea how how much this would actually lean into Logan. Right. So they had released a trailer like in the week leading up where they show Daphne Keen as as X-23 says so Laura. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I didn't see that trailer. I don't think I did either. Yeah, I, I, I know that they had released one, but I was like, well, I'm not I'm about to watch the movie anyway. I don't need to see another trailer, you know? Right, right. And so I, just by chance, I was like, hey, we should watch Logan since they hadn't seen it. And then this movie like basically starts right where Logan ended. I'm like, Wow. <laughs> that that's perfect. That's the perfect right? way to go right into it. <laughs> um the th- I think you know the way the movie contrived a way to get Wolverine back in, I was totally on board with. I I've seen some people be like, "Oh, I I don't like how the opening sequence, the bye 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 sequence disrespects the end of Logan." And I'm like, mm. "Come on." I mean, this really <laughs> is like I, uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's, this is one of those things where I'm like, look, Deadpool exists in its own little madcap world and, right. and nothing can, can undo the poignancy of the ending of Logan. Right. Right. Uh, the, this movie itself, it sort of acknowledges that, you know? I, yeah, that, that cracked me up. <laughs> when he oh, was so like, funny. Dig- he's like, oh, he's regenerative. He'll, he'll be fine. He digs him up. He's like, oh. <laughs> and then even just like holding up, like sitting next to his uh, metal skeleton. I mean, I was yep. just like, Ugh, all frustrated. <laughs> I was cracking up. So have you had Bye 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 stuck in your head for the last couple of days? <laughs> no, I've, I'm seeing it pop up all over my Instagram. For yeah, sure. my, my kid has been like listening to it for the last several days. So oh, funny. that's funny. I love that. Yeah, I have a feeling there's a lot of needle drops from this one that are getting renewed play, you know? Sure, sure. Um, but the 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 way in which they brought Hugh Jackman back, I was totally fine with. And then uh, certainly the first time watching it, the second time, I'm like, God damn, man, Hugh Jackman has never stopped giving it just 110% when he plays this role. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Like, like, the movie is comedic right but he he has to be wolverine in order for it to work Mm -hmm. you know and so he he never winks at the audience Mm -hmm. right and and like he makes the the emotional moments work he i I mean i'm i'm like in awe of how committed he is to this character even after all these years it 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 astounds me no i totally agree yeah you know uh but I, I also think like uh, when when it comes to to Ryan Reynolds, like cause you you were you, you sent me the little thing of of Ryan Re- uh, not Ryan Reynolds of like a Deadpool at Disneyland. Well, I was saying to you, these two actors are so linked to the cinematic versions of these characters. I can't Wolverine. I'm sure we'll have to get there, and then we'll find someone and Henry Cavill actually made it seem like, Oh, well maybe there could be like, I could, I, I would be happy with that. Yeah. But Ryan Reynolds, how do you get anyone else to play Deadpool and not think they're just trying to imitate what Ryan Ren- Reynolds singularly can do? And I told right. you, it, it feels like it'd be that version of when you see people playing those characters at Disneyland, playing the Disney characters. And then I saw a video of a character playing Deadpool at Disneyland. And it was exactly what I imagined. <laughs> You know, like some guy who doesn't sound like Ryan Reynolds trying to put on that affectation and it's like, ooh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it felt like. I was like, eh, I don't know about this. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, it would just always feel not quite it. You know what it felt like to me? You show it. Th- there was a period there um, it, from from the mid to late 90s where you had a whole bunch of people who thought they were Jim Carrey. Zachy, I swear our brains I was about to be like, you know, it kind of is like when everyone had a bad Jim Carrey impersonation. <laughs> so funny. Yes. It, well, then I think we're right, Zachy. <laughs> we, both, we both thought that. Yeah. No, it's true. And it's like cringy and hard. You're like, no, 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 no. You know? <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah. Well, there were a lot of Easter eggs in the movie. 
Oh man, yeah. You know, speaking of you not watching the last trailer, I don't think I did either because I thought. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what this movie. That's its currency is all the surprises and all the jokes, and I mm-hmm. didn't want to have any of them ruined. And there was a lot I didn't know about this going into it. Yeah, so that's I was going to ask you. I mean, it, 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 you know, first of all, how many of the references did you catch, and were there any that went went over your head? And like, what was what was yeah. their audience's reaction like for to the various reveals? I mean, the audience was completely on board. I feel like I caught most of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly, I, I love that his team is made up of Electra. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> You're, the very first movie you worked on, Brian. Yep, one of one. Uh, maybe the second movie. The second movie uh-huh. I worked on, and wow. uh, I love seeing her get her due there. <laughs> so that felt really good. <laughs> um, but then Bl- I think we had heard that she might be involved, but Blade yes. Wesley Snipes when he popped on screen. Total did not surprise. see that coming at all, yep. um, which was kind of amazing. And just knowing how uh, Wesley Snipes can be a little uh, staunch, maybe, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Like <laughs> Playing that guy. And then they even referenced that, right? With uh, I f- You probably remember better than I do when Deadpool says something about Wesley Snipes not really loving working with him or something. Because they yeah, didn't get along on Blade a- 3, right? On Blade 3, that's right. Yeah, I love that they even, I mean, you know what I mean? That's like stuff you have to read the gossip sites and things to to even know what that joke is. Um, yeah, that, and then Gambit, of course. I loved that so much. It made me so happy. First of all, I did not know it was coming at all, mm-hmm. which is the best way to experience that. But knowing that Channing Tatum, this was like his dream to play Gambit. And mm-hmm. he was so open in years past about how much he wanted to do that you know and it was that movie because we've talked about it on our podcast it kept getting yanked from one director the day, and eventually it was like a mercy killing when it was finally canceled right yeah and yet all along we knew it was this was something channing tatum was desperately passionate about mm-hmm. and he got the chance and and he looked great he looked exactly like gambit from the comics and the cartoon show mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and I don't know. I was like, man, I, I, I would have liked to have seen that movie, you know? I know. It's nice that he got to look cool. Like, they, they do, like, some fun humor with his accent and everything. But f- by and large, he gets to be a cool version of Gambit. He gets to have an action scene with his cards. Like, I mean, that must have, I don't know. It was amazing for, I'm certainly, for, I'm sure, for Channing Tatum, but also for audiences who've been reading about this for so long, finally getting to see what he wanted to have us all see for so long. Yep. It's very funny. He's like, they call me Gambit, and Deadpool's like, are you sure they? Uh, is, or is it just something you you wish people would have called you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, when they're talking about being in that void, and uh, Electra and Blade talk about winding up there, and Gambit's like, I kind of feel like I was born here. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so, I like where where I guess Daredevil was at one time part of their group, and then he died, and this is the Ben Affleck Daredevil, and he's like, oh Daredevil, I'm so sorry, and <laughs> Electra's like, no, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That was like rare. <laughs> I know, I know. But that's the, you know what I mean? That's what this movie is. And so it's like sort of like what I've always appreciated about Family Guy in a way, where mm-hmm. they'll do a joke that you go, I know the majority of the audience doesn't understand this, but this is some weird little bit of trivia I have in my head. And I don't know how <laughs> they get away with doing that. Why the mm-hmm. an executive doesn't say no. <laughs> you know, no one's going to get that. But they do it. And the people who get it feel seen. It's just, that's what this movie is a lot like, right? It's just Mm -hmm. so many of those little things, gossipy things from the real world, movie (laughs) development world. And like just throwing those little comments in there. And I I mean, everyone in my theater certainly got all of it. Yeah. Well, definitely that opening day crowd was the, was the group to see it with. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and And, of course, uh, 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 Chris Evans as Johnny Storm. The that was probably when I clapped really hard. <laughs> that reveal was incredible, <laughs> right? Where you think, or at least Deadpool thinks that he's Captain America, and he's even wearing blue. I think there's a little uh-huh. splash, blue and red, splash, and he's yeah, like red, gloves. red. Yep, <laughs> yeah, and thinks he's gonna help him out, and then when he goes, flame on. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think that's when i really got what the movie was doing it's like oh this is a celebration of the forgotten marvel superheroes the fox marvel superheroes yeah yeah, yeah it, it it's funny because you know 
when you think about it, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness did something similar with like all the little cameos and stuff they put in, right? Mm-hmm. But there was kind of like a there was a hint of fu in those cameos. Mm, sure. And I don't. I mean, I mean just because that Sam Raimi's sensibility it was like, oh, you want to see this? Oh, you want John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic? Here he is. Oh, he's dead. You know? <laughs> right, 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 right. And you're like, oh, my God, you don't have to be so mean about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, but, but there, yeah, the, the, there's a bit of zaniness here. I mean, the way that, that they take out Johnny Storm, I have to be honest, I cackled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so ridiculous, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then how that even played into the, the scene after the credits. Dude, so funny. Or that turns out that it was... is actually what he said. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you could tell Chris Evans was having fun being that character again. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because, I, I, you know, I, I don't dislike those Fantastic Four movies as much as other people. But, I mean, Chris Evans was the best part of them. Yeah, he. I remember him. I remember he was the fun one. Yeah, you know, yeah. so so it was interesting to see him sort of uh, slip back into that. Uh, when when Deadpool embarks through the the timelines and tries to find Wolverine, we see lots of different Wolverine cameos, which I I I I gobbled up every single one of those because those were such such deep cut callbacks to the comic books. Mm. Like they were covers, right? Some of them were specific covers. Yeah. So so as he uh, as he goes through. The timeline. Let's see. The the I'm, uh, this is just from memory. He 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 um he lands on on a world where it's like a, a it's Wolverine like crucified on an X. Right. So that's that's the cover of uh, of X Men two hundred and fifty one. Wow. That's a pretty iconic cover. There's also he ends up on a timeline. Oh, where it's like short Wolverine. Yes. Right. Right. And. And that's very funny because he even says, oh, look at you all comic book accurate or something to that effect. Because Wolverine <laughs> is supposed to be short, right? This is people forget this because because Hugh Jackman is a big, you know, behemoth of a man. But but Wolverine is supposed to be, you know, like for something, you know? Right. <laughs> like people call him runt and shorty, you know? Right, right. Um, and of course, you realize how silly that would look, you know? <laughs> right, right. Um, and then, of course, you have Cavalrine. Yes. <laughs> which very funny he's like hey we treat you way better than those jerks uh, you know down the street or whatever down the street says. yeah <laughs> uh, so this has been a rumor this is like a john krasinski as mr fantastic thing mm. and i dismissed it up to this point but i gotta be honest seeing him as wolverine i'm like i'm okay with that for whenever jackman decides to hang it up mm. he looked well apparently till he's 90 he's gonna be doing it but <laughs> That's true. Um, so he also lands on a on a world where you have the uh, you have a Wolverine fighting the Hulk. Yes, right. So so that and he's wearing the brown and and uh, tan costume. So that's um, that's the cover of Incredible Hulk three forty. Where mm-hmm. if you see it in the movie, he he takes his claws out and you see the Hulk reflected in his claws. So that's actually a Todd McFarlane cover. Oh wow. That they translated. Uh, you also have the the Wolverine with the with the one hand. He's wearing like a black thing, and he just he has one hand, and he just starts. It's like a post apocalyptic world, and he just starts killing uh, Deadpool. There, that's that's from a storyline called Age of Apocalypse. Hmm. Uh, you also have the one where 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 Deadpool uh, approaches Wolverine sitting on a porch, where he's wearing like a cowboy hat, mm-hmm. um, and then Wolverine shoots him with a shotgun. That's from a storyline called Old Man Logan. <laughs> I love it. Where Logan is an old man, uh, you also have the 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 world where he's wearing a white tuxedo as and he has an eye patch. Yes, so that's from uh, the early issues of the uh, regular Wolverine comic book from the late eighties, where he was in Madripoor, which is a country that we've seen in the MCU, and he just uh, he had a, another identity as a guy called Patch, who just kind of he didn't wear his Wolverine costume; he was just Patch. I love that. See, I didn't know that. And I thought at first, I think that was one of the earlier ones. And I thought they were just going to riff on like, oh, a James Bond type of Wolverine or mm-hmm. this or that or whatever. And I love that this is all directly linked to references, specific references. Yeah. Every single Wolverine that we see is some reference to something out of the comic books. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Which I think is which I think is pretty cool. Um, and of course, you have Power of Love playing during that sequence, which is entirely appropriate. <laughs> There's a couple of Huey Lewis needle drops in this one, actually, I think. Yeah, pretty close together made me notice it. Um, Yeah. I did want to ask you, though. So 
I might have missed this, but why was he? Why did he take the one uh, Wolverine that he took, and not any of the others? Were the others just too like tied up or aggressive, or was that kind of the joke? And this is the only one. Yeah, so it was either the the one guy was crucified, so that that was out. The short guy was short. Right, right, right. Uh, so right. that was out. The other guys just like killed him. <laughs> right, right, right. I think I was just too caught up in laughing and sort of <laughs> yeah. appreciating so all the differences. This, yeah. this was the one who who didn't just outright murder him right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of you know I I was talking with Sean about this over text and he was trying he was racking his brain trying to make sense of so this is like. It's Earth one zero 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 five, but it has all these other timelines. So are those all different Earths? And I, and I was like, well, I think if you try to decipher this too hard, your brain will implode <laughs> as if somebody is sticking their hands into your head, a la Cassandra. <laughs> right, yes. Um, yep. But I'm Very like, visual. well, I oh, terrific, and that's right out of the comics too. Cassandra Nova is from the uh, a, a, a series called New X Men by Grant Morrison. Mm, okay. Uh, and that was her whole deal. She would just stick her hands right into your head, and it was quite disgusting body horror. And they translated that pretty effectively. Yeah, really well. Um, but I, my sense is that, and this is just me, and I am probably going to st- start making less sense as I go. But um, <laughs> every universe, every every every, um, every Earth is like the, a branch in in a tree. Or like, or like the trunk of a tree, and then the different timelines are the branches. Mm-hmm. So you see it in the graphic, right? Where it's like there's like the central line that's the universe, but there's all little branches off it. Those are all the little alternate timelines within that. Like, what if Marty had taken the sports almanac back to '85? Exactly. Yeah. Um. Oh, speaking of that, I I saw somebody. This is unconnected to this movie, but you you brought it back to the future. How? When Marty wakes up at the end of Back to the Future, there's like a Huey Lewis poster on his wall. Yeah. And when the movie starts, Huey Lewis is the 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 <laughs> teacher, right? Right, right, and right, right. They were like, what if like Marty changed the future and made Huey Lewis, instead of being his button down music teacher, <laughs> is now <laughs> this like rock star? And I was like, I kind of love that. <laughs> I thought I had heard every theory possible about Back to the Future. <laughs> I love that. So when he wakes up, now he is in our reality. We begin yes. in a different <laughs> reality. Yeah. So so that teacher was not played by Huey Lewis. He is Huey Lewis. Right, right. <laughs> by mowing down that one pine tree. <laughs> <laughs> he gave us hip to be square. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway <laughs> let's talk about this one um uh, other things that 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 jumped out i mean wolverine's mask okay so here's my thought about wolverine's mask first of all it looked great yeah i really liked it i'm glad to see it finally i'm gonna say this i don't know if this is controversial i don't think he should have had the white eyes i don't disagree Actually, I, I, I loved it. I thought he looked very cool, but it did sort of, uh, put him at a distance or something or. Yeah. Like I think Deadpool, it's sort of baked in. We know he, he had the white eyes. I think, I think with Wolverine, I think we should see Hugh Jackman's eyes, even when he wears that, that mask. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that. I thought it looked cool. I, uh, but yeah, there was something a little off about it in a way that his character isn't right yes yeah i think just seeing his eyes would have solved it you know yeah yeah but just seeing him slide that on and and like jumping around and mowing oh my did the crowd just go ape shit when that happened oh yeah yeah and and the fact that he kept it on for so long you know it wasn't just sort of like all right we're gonna do that for a scene and then just yeah and then take it off again yeah yeah exactly um the oh um nice pool i thought was (laughs) absolutely hilarious yeah uh how he's so canadian he's like sorry right (laughs) um and just the way he dies i was rolling (laughs) right 
Because <laughs> you forget, like, oh yeah, Deadpool's like a sociopath. Like this <laughs> Right. And even Wolverine's a- like, you did that on purpose. <laughs> like, he's like, he's like, he's like, I'm gonna avenge his death. He's like, he died of murder, you <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so funny. Um that was Blake Lively as uh, Lady Deadpool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I kind of assumed I, thought right? that, I mean that was I thought, there was speculation. Yeah. I, yeah, and uh, they even say like earlier in the film, oh, she just had a baby, but she looks great. And he's like, oh, no, you're not supposed to say that. Oh, that's funny. I don't know if I caught that. <laughs> yeah, um, there was. Oh, oh, the other thought I had was Rob Delaney is great in this, right? Yes, but I was like, I was thinking about how really he's like a completely third tier character in the second one. Mm-hmm. Right, 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 right. But I was like. You know, when all of this shit happened with T.J. Miller, where you're like, oh, wait, he's kind of like a piece of shit, and we don't want to have him in this movie. Like, thank mm-hmm. God they had Rob Delaney on deck. Right, right. To be, like, the best friend, you know? Totally, yeah. He's very funny in this. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, you know, sp- speaking of, um, I think Planes, Trains came up already, but uh, I was texted you as soon as I got out. I was like, look, I'm not going to spoil anything, but there's something I have to point out. But this one point where they're traversing through the void, I am 99.9% sure I saw the rental car from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles and Del Griffith's trunk in front. I mean, that's no, that's no, the trunk is what put me over the top. I was like, that has to be it. Um, And there's a lot of references, even the mug he's using that says, I like me. And, uh, (laughs) and even the the ending itself with him, uh, him bringing Logan, like uh, Logan along to the dinner with his friends is a lot like the ending of Planes, Trains. So it's, I have to imagine that's all intentional. Well, uh, this is this is via slash film. There's a little east, a literal Easter egg in the film, and more of a spiritual one as well. Let's talk about the literal one first. Deadpool and Wolverine have been sent to the void, and after they blast out of Cassandra Nova's lair, you can see the wrecked and burnt car from planes, trains, and automobiles, and John Candy's character's trunk sitting in front of it on the ground in the wasteland. There it is. All Does right. It te- technically, makes sense that these items from this other movie would be <laughs> present in the void. Nope. But in a film as meta as this one, where Reynolds' actual life has alluded to a few times via Blake Lively references, I suppose the film can get away with it. The spiritual Easter egg comes a bit later during a scene in which Deadpool and Wolverine are driving in a van and Wolverine goes off at Deadpool, insulting him and calling him a joke. The moment is so similar to the way Neil Page goes off on Del Griffith in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles that I fully expected Deadpool to actually respond by quoting Candy's famous I like me speech. That doesn't happen, of course. Yep, this isn't the first time Deadpool has paid tribute to this particular movie. Um, so there you go, Brian. Love it. And, and there you go. <laughs> I'm so mad at myself because because you had texted me before I watched it, and then I just got so pulled in, I forgot to look for it. And the second time, I was like, "All right, here we go. I'm going to look for it." And then I just got pulled in again, and I forgot. So I, you know, I should have mentioned specifically when it happened. Yeah, that's yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, what else? What else? What, tell me the things, uh, especially for you. Like, I mean, I'm curious the ones that jumped out at you or made you laugh the hardest. Oh, the, in ter- in terms of laughing the hardest, it, it the 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 reference the, there was there was one that was really funny to me. Oh, oh, where where um where he calls nice pool Van Milder. <laughs> yeah, right, and, right. And then, and then he's like, "Oh, are we are we gently nudging the fourth wall? I can do that too." And he just turns the camera and goes, "The proposal, right, right, right." <laughs> um, no, but but that that scene where I just read about, you know, where where they're fighting in the in the van, like right before that, that was what I was talking about. Where they're driving, it's it's Deadpool and Wolverine, and and Deadpool's like. Oh, if if they can restore your timeline, what are you going to do? And he's like, "What do you mean? If you said they can?" And then you know he just goes off on him. And and first of all, I love that educated wish became like a runner throughout. Mm-hmm. Um, but also just the way Hugh Jackman plays that moment where he's so pissed off, but he he's playing it in a in a in a lane that's like believably pissed off. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I don't know if this makes sense, but like. You can be over the top mad, and that works for a comedy. But he has to play it straight mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because his heartache is real. Right? Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Like he's right? in a and drama. So, exactly. Yeah. Right. And so that's why, like, the Wolverine story totally tracks. See, this is why people are like, "Oh, 
this is this ruins the end of Logan. And I'm like, it doesn't in any way ruin the end of Logan because because just textually, it's a different character mm-hmm. than that one. But beyond that, um, uh, you know, all of the angst and everything that that Logan embodied in that movie. Well, that's all present in this character, you know, right, right. This is Brian. This is weird to me, like. Because I'm seeing a lot Bet- between between Wolverine and Downey coming back. It's a lot of like, oh, that emotional death is now ruined for me forever, right? Mm. And I, I look as a, as a matter of course, I would say if you've had an emotional death scene, then if you're going to wind it back, you have to. There has to be a justification for it, other than hey, I'm back now, right? Right. Let's stipulate that. But you know what? For for more than uh, forty years audiences have watched the wrath of Khan and gotten emotional at Spock dying at the end, Mm -hmm. knowing that the next movie is called the search for Spock. (laughs) Sure. And they'll probably find him, (laughs) which is referenced in this movie. Yes, exactly. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so my point is like, it, and you, I mean, you and I, we watched Wrath of Khan for the show a couple of years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Is is that death scene any less emotional? No, I mean, obviously, in 1982, when that came out, it would probably play different from someone who knows sees the tile for part three on their uh, Netflix, <laughs> knowing that's coming. Yeah, it just plays differently. But no, of course not, because yeah, the the reality of that moment, you know. It's 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 acted well. It's written well. You are caught up in the, that moment. If well, let's put it this way: if it's done well, then if it's done well. no, it shouldn't matter. It, right, exactly. And it's and about so, the sacrifice, specifically speaking to Star Trek. Yeah, and so so in that same vein, right? If if Leonard Nimoy had not come back, then we would have missed out on f- six more movies featuring him. You know. Right. Right. And what a loss that would have been, right? Right. And so that's how I feel. I'm like, look, we got, for however long it might be, at least a couple more movies, I hope, we got Hugh Jackman back as Wolverine. Well, you know what? Actually, this feels like it could almost go into another conversation, which is multiverses. Yes. Right? So, I mean, if you can just, if there are billions. Well, well, I think Deadpool is speaking for you, where he's like, guys, let's just take the L and move on. <laughs> I mean, I think they, I'm okay with them so far, actually. I think they've handled them pretty well. Um, I mean, I think, I I did buy into some of the emotional stuff in this. Although, again, at the end, some of the stakes, and I didn't understand what was going on, but it didn't really matter to me. It was more like, just have them stop the thing, and then he's next to his girlfriend, (laughs) even though I don't know why they really broke up, but it's fine. You know, like, (laughs) but I think Spider-Man No Way Home is probably the perfect example of like a really emotionally potent movie that figured out how to have fun and use the multiverse for dramatic stakes. Well, um, if, if I can, if I can just add to that, I think the, the spider verse movies. Sure. Oh yes, of course. Spider verse. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so I think we're at that moment where you could start to speculate. Is this going too far? And will anything matter if there are like thousands and thousands of this one character, if this one doesn't work out and, I don't know. We might step into that. To my opinion, yeah. I don't know that we have gone too far into it yet for me to feel that way. Although I can definitely see the threat of it. I think that the Marvel folks are probably acutely aware of everything you're talking about. Yeah. And if anything, I think they looked at the response to, for example, the flash. Mm. Uh, and are like, okay, we probably want to avoid some of the, pitfalls that that movie had you know sure um and and this is helpful is what i'm saying right so in the in other words we're in the thick of this this so-called multiverse saga and and the only times they've really leaned hard into it thus far have been um no way home multiverse of madness and and deadpool right Mm -hmm. and so i i'm kind of with you where i'm like a, a lot of that multiverse angst feels like, you know, it, it feels overwrought mm-hmm. based on what we've seen up to this point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my concern, 
is it, the secret wars will be kind of this thing where you got, this is like the bad version where you've got just like Avengers Endgame, you got a bunch of portals opening and, Oh, here's like the Fox X-Men coming out of this portal. Mm. And here's the, you know, the, mm. you know, the fan four stick coming out of this portal. Like, I don't want to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Then it'll, but it'll I don't think anybody much. wants to see that. It'll be unwieldy and hard to emotionally track with. I think. Yeah. If we get so, to that. Yeah. I mean, I think the, what the opportunity is, is to say, look, Thanks to this multiversal, uh, uh, you know, uh, business, we can take the best aspects of this stuff. Right. So, hey, if you can find a way to 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 have Wolverine fight the Hulk, I mean, I would want to see that. <laughs> sure. Hugh Jackman, Wolverine, like. If if Hugh Jackman is is now at least amenable to the idea of continuing to play Wolverine for a little while longer, why not take advantage of it? I guess that's my point. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I you think know, this I, movie also benefits from being kind of a, a trifle a little bit. Like this is just mm-hmm. a dessert of a movie. That I think that's true. That happened to figure out a way to, like you say, it gave the, the opportunity to Hugh Jackman to play Wolverine straight. So we do still get to feel like we're witnessing a serious take on Wolverine, but the movie right. itself is just playful and fun and taking advantage of a lot of fourth wall, breaky things and whatever. And it's to me, it's honestly like a miraculous little package that could possibly not work. And it totally did. Um, right. So they just need to tread carefully as they, if they want to bring Wolverine back, I, I would love to see him again, but probably have to think a lot more about it yeah well i i think i think now he's in the mix i think i think he's he's on the board again now like this this wolverine this wolverine yeah right and and effectively like when you think about it, this was this movie was the hump like mm. you you had to crack the nut okay how do we find a way to bring back <laughs> wolverine okay they've cracked it like now now if wolverine shows up and it's just wolverine people aren't gonna be like oh no but what about logan like no we're past that now Right, right. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, nah, totally. So, so if I were to guess, I would say Jackman is in the mix for at least, at least Secret Wars. I think we're going to see him. Mm. I don't see any reason why that's not a high high probability thing to happen. I could see that, and most of his uh, X Men colleagues are wiped out, so you don't need to think about bringing those people back. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and then assuming Secret Wars is kind of like a soft reset. Okay, well then after that, he he retires and you you know bring in uh, cavalry or whatever. Sure, sure. Like that if I, and this is just rampant speculation at this point. I think Secret Wars ends with some kind of reshuffling. Earths are merged, and you end up with a, an Earth where mutants have been on it the whole time, and the Fantastic Four's right. been there the whole time, and maybe maybe some original characters are back in play with new actors. I don't know, but you know, kind of a a soft reboot. That, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but I'm saying that's that. If I were to guess, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, it's a way they could do it. You know. Yeah. Uh, but to to the point that you were making earlier, it's it you know. Ryan Reynolds is in a position now where he can hold them up for, for a lot of money if they want a Deadpool four, you know, you know, it, Oh, for certainly it's funny because I, I would certainly show up for a Deadpool four and be very curious what that would look like. And it, it would be funny if these Deadpool movies then moving forward, were just commentaries on the state of things. Yeah, <laughs> you <know>? exactly. Right. <laughs> for hero world and Marvel and whatnot. But, uh, it's still hard to imagine him being in an Avengers movie. Right. Like it, it you know what I mean? Like you don't really want the piss taken out of that in the middle of that adventure. I mean, I see like a cutaway cameo and that's it. Totally. Totally. Right. So I'll be curious. You're probably wondering why I'm not in this. Well, I'm not or something, you know, and then like, that's it, you know? Yeah. Because I mean, if you make half a billion dollars worldwide and your opening weekend, I doubt this is the last we see of Deadpool. Oh, there's going to be more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) he's, he's a new anchor being of some kind. I'll tell you that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah 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 you, you know, know i also liked cassandra nova a lot i thought that was like a yeah. really interesting scary villain right i mean emma corn was great yeah i agree oh and by the way aaron stanford as pyro i'm gonna say i liked seeing him again uh oh yeah yeah you know what? i 
it's been a while. I, I was even like, wait, is that the guy? Yeah, I didn't recognize him initially. Um, and then once he started sucking out the fire, you know, I was like, oh, yeah. pyro. Yep, yep. Oh, and then real quick, speaking much earlier in the episode about Blade, I mean, Wesley Snipes himself says there's only one Blade. <laughs> yeah, but in a, they in a kinda... Marvel movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's that about? Only ever going to be one blade. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, Deadpool kind of looks at the camera and it's like the, the beauty of, of his, his, you know, no eyes is you can just project whatever meaning onto that look. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Cause either it's like, oh, he doesn't know what's coming or it's, yeah, mm-hmm. we know. Cause <laughs> we can't get our shit together. You know, that's the genius. That's the genius of, uh, you get to apply whatever you want to his face. And 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 the nice thing is if Ryan Reynolds does decide to tap out, they can just get that Disneyland guy to <laughs> right. just slide him right in. Oh, man, that'd be amazing. No one will know the difference. <laughs> I've got to feel bad now. But, I mean, look, it's, there's just no way. There's just no way. It is kind of, isn't that kind of amazing, too? Doesn't that say something? That they have a Deadpool character at Disneyland? I was that's yeah I was I when you sent me that I was like well I guess this is where we're at now here we are <laughs> yep. yep I don't know I, how I feel about it yeah he's making jokes about uh finding the grinder app on yep. Tony Stark's computer <laughs> that's right like, hey here we are <laughs> that's the weird thing cuz cuz my 13 year old and my 10 year old are like oh can we go see it and I'm like no you can't you can't see it you know mm-hmm. And it's like they're gonna end up watching it eventually at some point. Yeah, but I'm like, I mean, this is a Rubicon that's been crossed in terms of content in a Marvel movie. This is like pegging jokes, and that was very funny when he winks at the camera. He's like, "Yeah, oh, first for Disney," <laughs> and then he winks. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think. Uh, to, oh, you know, we didn't mention at all. This is directed by Sean Levy, mm-hmm. who. Uh, you know, he's the night at the museum guy, but he's he's found a, a a real real. Oh, and actually, he worked with Hugh Jackman previously on on Real Steel. I just realized that. Oh yeah, so he's worked with both of them, and didn't he do the the Adam Project movie? He did Adam no, Project, Free Guy, Free well, Guy, and Adam guys. Project, both of them. Okay, so he's acquainted with both of them. Yeah, so he he's he's got got a, a obviously a, a good good working relationship, but but really, I mean, this is a director proof franchise. Oh, for sure, yeah, right. Because because it's been a different one for for each of these movies, and so so it is really the the Ryan Reynolds show. Um, I think to the point you were making earlier, uh, the 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 weak spot, which I think it it bumped you, it bumped me too, is is the fact that the movie starts with uh, uh, Wade and Vanessa having been broken up, and they don't yeah. really even address why. Okay, so it's coming from someone who's seen it twice. Yes. <laughs> I I it was like she wanted him to live up to his potential or something and I was so, like So the when the movie starts yeah. uh, following the, you know, the the opening the bye 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 scene, he's he he's in Happy Hogan's office. Yes. And he, yeah. and he wants to be joined the Avengers, right? Uh-huh. And he says I need this, I I need to matter something to that effect. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, so maybe Vanessa's like, make something of yourself. And so he's like, I need to impress my girlfriend. I need to join the Avengers. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the way, people are like, oh, how is he on the 616 Earth? And I'm like, I don't freaking know, man. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> sure. You know, um, but she says, like, later on, there's a scene, like a flashback to them talking to each other. And she's like, trying to console him for n- having been turned down by the Avengers. Right. So I guess my point is, it's not clear exactly why they are broken up and and given that the first two movies are really just about how much they love each other that that was like a sour note for me yeah yeah and it doesn't feel like it would be even that difficult as as thin as that is within the film itself you know just giving him some sort of arc um but you know i mean it we're here for the fun it's yeah it's a it's a small thing um the actually in in addition to bye 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 uh like a prayer i've been listening to that one yeah yeah that was a big i you know featured a lot in the uh trailer but that's a big part of the film too yes and and the final sequence i was thinking about like like if you're gonna do like a blue sky beam ending this is not a blue sky beam ending but it's it's like 
sky beam adjacent. I'm like, this is how you do it, in my opinion. You know, I kind of liked it too because it was understandable in a different sort of way. The self sacrifice exactly. of it. Yes, that was you know, exactly and right. it's like this yeah. villain wants to gain. You know, it's a power bar thing. I think I've said this before. I always, or like a download bar or whatever you want to call it. I yeah. always respond to those in movies where someone needs to download something and you're seeing the bar and they're cutting back. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Like there's just something so understandable and you've experienced that stress before. Yeah. And so seeing them fighting essentially a power bar with their right. own bodies <laughs> trying to right. disable that. I mean, that's very understandable and you know, you're really feeling for them, you know, well, it- the other thing that really worked for me is obviously you have the bit where they're basically fighting each other over who gets to do the heroic sacrifice. Yes. Right? And they both do it. Right. And by virtue of that, that's the reason they both survive. Mm. Which I think is so interesting, right? Because essentially Deadpool goes in there and he can't reach the other side of the thing. Right. And the whole thing is he has to be the conduit between mm. the matter and the antimatter. So then Logan comes in there and he completes the circuit. Right. Right. But I mean, it's like, obviously they're not going to die. Right. That's the name of the movie. But like what I like is that there's an internal logic to it, which makes sense, which is that they both have the healing factor. Mm -hmm. And so by virtue of the fact that they've locked hands, they're essentially passing the healing factor back and forth. Mm. So in other words, they both needed to do it in order for them both to survive. I like that. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. You know, um, and, and I think, I think the way it culminates it, I, I found it heartfelt. I found it meaningful. Logan has a new family. Um, by that did work of, for me, by the way, I just want to say, as I, I was saying that about the other stuff that I thought that was very sweet, him joining them at the end. Yeah. And the fact that Laura is there mm-hmm. and if Laura is there, that means the other, uh, people who are in the void are still there too. Right. Or, the, or they, they got pulled out, you know, got out. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I don't know. It's, it's a good one. I, I enjoyed it. It's a romp. It's a total it, romp. And it's, uh, it's an inside baseball romp, which is even more satisfying sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but by the end of the movie, you know, I, I had a smile on my face, not unlike Dell Griffiths right before, uh, <laughs> the, the credits roll on, on, uh, 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 uh planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I, I kind of wish that's how the movie would have ended. You know, like Blind Al is like, well, hello, Logan. And he's just kind of like, nice to meet you, Blind Al. And then freeze frame on his <laughs> smile. I actually face. thought, I, I realized they were doing the planes, trains ending when he's talking to him and like, hey, why don't you join me and whatever. Right. I did wonder if it was going to start mirroring the shot. <laughs> or at least play that song as they walk up to the Oh, apartment. that would have been fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. But hey, I think that's a good place to wrap things up. What do you say? Yeah, this is fun. I was looking forward to this. Yeah, man. We talked for longer than the movie. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. We've been complaining about movie lengths. And ever (laughs) since then, we have been running longer than usual. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, hey, you know what? When when you're having fun, you don't want to stop. So that's the way I look at it. I agree. Uh, but thank you everybody for listening. If you have thoughts on Deadpool and Wolverine, either you agree or disagree with us, either way is fine, but you can email us at moviefilmpodcast at gmail.com. You can also hit like on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash moviefilmpodcast. Uh, if you're looking for me online, you can find me on social media at Zachy's Corner. That's Z-A-K-I-S Corner. And uh, I'm my, my review of Batman Cape Crusader is up at the San Francisco Chronicle. What about you, Brian? What do you got? Uh, I can't wait to read that, by the way. I haven't read that yet. Um, you can find episodes I've written of Young Jedi Adventures on Disney Plus and Disney Junior. There you go. And uh, we got some fun stuff coming, including a commentary track we alluded to earlier in the episode. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, we'll also be talking about uh, M. Night Shyamalan's latest movie, Trap. Yeah, I'm excited for that. Um, that's uh, coming up next uh, week, I think, right? I, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Wow. Oh, it's actually being released like this week. Wow. Okay. See, t- time is... I'm I'm all I'm all multiversed up. I don't know what 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 day is when. What's going on? Uh, that's coming up soon, so we're we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, as always, if you like what we're doing, please go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Leave a star rating; every little bit helps. Also, uh, you can follow us on YouTube. Hit subscribe on the Movie Film Podcast YouTube channel, and uh, that'll help us out as well. So, uh, with that, on behalf of my partner Brian Hall, my name is Aki Hassan. This has been Movie Film Two Ninety Seven. Catch you next time. Thank you, folks. Welcome friends, it's the
Podcast. Podcast, enjoy the show. Zachy.